Good morning, Sales Academy listeners, followers, uh, YouTubers, podcasters. I wanted to share with you something that's, uh, I guess, troubled me for a number of years, in fact. Having been a professional salesperson for a large number of years, and before that, a corporate salesperson who was forced to do numbers uh, and forced to do targets and effectively forced to take business that wasn't right for the customer or for us, but it got business over the line. Uh, so the bad end of sales through to the good end of sales. I've been everything in between. So I stand here proud of who I am now and ashamed of who I was in the past. So I can't be more brutal. I can't be more honest than that. And this is going to be one of those podcasts. So the phrase I hear a lot in sales, and I've heard a lot for years, and I really disagree with it. And I hope by the end of this podcast, you will too. And that is, you need to convince me of this. <clears throat> now, this comes from buyers. This comes from people who are making the decision to part with money. This comes with to, um, from people who are in the hot seat, so to speak. Now, interestingly enough, um, the sales guy gets the bad end of the rap a lot of the time. Uh, but there are also, there's also a phrase like you'll hear phrases about salespeople like all salesmen are conmen and all that sort of stuff and blah, blah, blah. But there's also a phrase within buyers or within salespeople about buyers, which is all buyers are liars which is also just as brutal and detrimental. But the reality is not all salespeople are bad and not all buyers are bad. Are there bad people in sales that behave badly? Uh, absolutely. It's been an industry that's been founded on mistrust, smoke and mirrors, kind of like magicians as opposed to wizards. I prefer to be a wizard these days. Wizards create alchemy. They bring together people and things and we create alchemy. It's like a science in psychology and relationships and products and services and you bring that together and when you create brilliant relationships and people that have lifetime value then you create alchemy within the business world and i love that and there's no smoke and mirrors and illusion and trickery within that right it's about getting deep down and dirty and real and exposing all the fears and challenges but doing it from a place where you hold out your hand you offer that support to that someone without without the guarantee of business at the end of it because i tell you what i care enough that you buy better. Now, whether you choose to buy through, through me or not, well, we'll figure that out along the way. But I'm absolutely passionate about the fact that you buy better. And that's what I train a lot of people on and I have done for years. And that's because that's my core values and I won't compromise on those. So buyers are liars, salesmen are conmen and all that sort of stuff. You need to convince me of this. And that comes in, th in things like, you need to convince me that this is a good decision. Right, so let's tackle some of these things bit by bit. You need to convince me that this is a good decision. You need to convince me that this is right for my business. You need to convince me um, that you're the right person to deal with. Right? These are the kind of standard phrases that you hear a lot within sales meetings and conversations and relationships. So you need to convince me that this is the right decision. Before I get into that, I want to I want to um, share my instant gut reaction to that kind of phrase, and that is, "What a crock of horse shit." And somebody said recently, oh, that's a bit American. Okay, uh, rather than judge me based on my phrase, why not ask me where the phrase comes from? Why not seek to understand? There's a brilliant sales skill right there. Seek to understand, right? Listen to understand. Not listen to respond. Not listen to what you can cleverly say next. Not listen to dive into features, advantages, and benefits, or as we now call vomit, right? Listen to understand. Listen to care enough. Seek to understand. So when I say a crock of horse shit, I don't care whether it sounds American. Here's my rationale to why I say horse shit, not bullshit. Because bullshit is like a one dimensional flat dinner plate size pile of shit. It's tiny. Have you ever seen what a horse leaves behind? It's like a trail of massive dollops of huge mounds of shit. That's what I'm talking about in terms of a belief system that comes with, you need to convince me that this is a good decision. And here's why. And I believe this is important for all of us to hear. Because we don't make good or bad decisions. Fundamentally, we make decisions. And when we make a decision, we either back it to fail or we back it to win. So, let me explain a little bit about what I mean, because this comes into confirmation bias and other things and stuff. So my dad, bless him, before he passed, grammar school educated, very intelligent man. We would watch Who Wants to Be a Millionaire, for example. 
and Chris Tarrant, bless him, would come on and give a question and it'd be like, so uh, what's, I don't know, what's the largest continent on the planet? Four answers there. And the guy goes 50-50 and it leaves two, Asia and Africa, Asia and Africa. Let's just say Asia's B and Africa's D. And I, I can't even remember now which is biggest, but I think it's, um, I think it's Asia. But here we go. So um, let's just say my dad's going B. B, Asia, uh, uh, sorry, D, Africa. It's D, it's Africa. It's D, it's Africa. For God's sake, man, it's D, it's Africa. And then Chris Town reveals the answer and he says, it's B, it's Asia. And at that point, instead of it just accepting he was wrong, my dad would say, oh, I knew I'd get that wrong. How many times do we do that as human beings? Even though we know we're wrong, we still have the need to feel right. So we make a wrong decision and then we go, oh, I knew I'd get that wrong. This is what I mean about making a decision and then backing it to fail because you still want to be right because you made the decision, even though you knew in your heart and you knew in your gut, you shouldn't do. So we don't make good or bad decisions. We just make decisions. And then we work hard either way at making them good or bad. We work hard either way, at backing them to fail or backing them to win. So I can't convince you that this is a good decision. In fact, when you say to me things like on the receiving end as a salesperson for years, I don't like to be sold to. If I then went into the remit of convincing you that this is a good decision, well, effectively, what am I doing? I am selling to you. I am trying to persuade and influence and manipulate your decision so that you feel it's a good decision. And then literally just after, you'll have buyer's remorse because your gut kicks back in, your heart kicks back in, and you don't back the decision to win. Therefore, you self-fulfill and therefore, you can blame me because I sold to you, yet you asked me to convince you that it was the right decision. See where I'm going with this. An absolute cracker, crocker horseshit. So we've got to stop. We've got to stop with these expectations. We've got to stop with the past references. We've got to stop with the confirmation bias. And we've got to get a little bit real about what do we truly want. And that takes guts. That takes courage because that's getting real with your decision-making of the past. That's getting real with a potential complete stranger that you build a relationship with and trust in them. That's metaphorically getting naked and exploring this with somebody so they can help you buy better. So you need to convince me to make about a good decision. That's why salespeople fail ultimately longer term, because if that's what they're doing, then they are selling to you. I want to professionally help you buy. So in my heart and in my gut, I know, that I'm not right for everybody. In my gut and in my heart, I know my products and my services, as you can see behind me, they're not right for everybody. But I have it in my heart to care enough to help you figure that out. So my marketing, I get accused of being unprofessional because I swear or I do this or I mark and stuff. Do you know what? There's a difference between professional and serious. right? Because serious is a bit gray. But I am deadly frigging serious about life and I'm deadly frigging serious about business. And I'm deadly frigging serious about being professional at what I do. But that doesn't mean I can't have fun. That doesn't mean I can't be me, the authentic version of me. And that doesn't mean that in my marketing, I can't actively, sorry, I can actively, because I'm changing my language as I go, because I was about to say a double negative, right? I can actively focus my marketing on repelling the kind of people that aren't going to like me and attract the people that are going to like me. And the reason that's important is I'm not interested in being fake. So at the start of a sales process or at the start of a relationship or at the start of my mind, what I'm not going to do is pretend to be all this stuff and put some lovely, shiny, sparkly marketing together, hoping that you believe the bullshit within it. So then six months down the road after you've signed up because you've, you've fallen for it, you then find out who I really am and what I'm really about and what I really stand for. And at that point you go, oh, that doesn't really fit with my values. Well, right now I need to awkwardly exit myself from this which is a difficult and, and awkward conversation to have for anyone. Or we just kind of ghost like people do these days on social media and stuff, you know, cancel direct debits, cancel all friendships and ghost, which is just weird, but it happens because people are allowed to, because you can hide behind a keyboard, right? So rather than any of those shenanigans going on, I'd just rather be up front and straight from the start. So yes, I do swear. Yes, I do take the piss. Majority out of myself, right? Self-defecating humor is brilliant. Because if I take the piss out of myself, you struggle to take the piss out of me even more. So I'll go for it. But also I'll bounce it back. I'll have a good laugh and, and we have banter and we say some things that are a little bit edgy and all that sort of stuff. And I use language that I don't sort of filter through. Oh my God, am I going to offend somebody by saying this? 
I just keep it as real as I possibly can. And I encourage you to be the most authentic version of you and get as real as you can. And in the process of discovery, we explore what you need and why you need it and everything else. Now, in that process, we will find out whether we're right to do business together. And that comes from my marketing lead generation, right through my discovery process, right through becoming a customer, and then right through retaining and staying with me for as long as you can. Because I've got customers in Sales Academy that go back to 2013. I've got customers that have been with me for years in different businesses. I've got telecoms customers in my telecoms business that have been with me longer than that. Because I'm interested in lifetime relationships, not a quick buck, a quick deal, an individual sale. I'm not interested in shoppers who come once. I want customers who come again and again and again and again. So my entire business model and attitude and values are based on long-term value, long-term relationships. How do we make this work for the longer term? So that's what I'm interested in. And I want to encourage you guys to be the same. So when we talk about this, how to, you need to convince me, buyers are liars, salespeople are con men, we just need to get more honest. We just need to get more real. And we need to be prepared to make mistakes and expose ourselves as buyers and as salespeople. We need to be prepared to be a better human to help each other out in business better, accepting that I might not have the tools or the services or the products that you need. But my role as a business person is to then surround myself with people who can support you. So if you look at tradespeople, if you look at uh, the construction industry and you you know, you get general builders, yeah. And general builders are really good and they're good to a level, but then you get specialists within those trades. You get specialist electricians, qualified gas engineers, um, window fitters, plasterers, carpenters, right? Artistry. You get some real professionals. And what they don't do is bodge it. They actually work to a craft. They work to their excellence. And if somebody asks them to do something else, they can potentially turn their hand to it. But they'd rather refer another professional in. So they collaborate beautifully within the construction industry and always have. Other industries need to learn how to collaborate better. And that starts, I believe, with us as individual salespeople, as us as individual business owners, knowing our limits, knowing our remits, knowing our boundaries of what we are capable of and what we're not capable of, knowing our boundaries of what we will stand for and what we won't stand for, helping customers buy better so they stay with us for longer and they enjoy the process and they learn how to buy better as individuals. So that has a, 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 a ripple effect across all of their buying decisions. And then what we start doing is we start educating procurement to procure things better. We start educating buyers to become more fearless in their approach because everything comes from fear based in that sort of whole process. Somebody has, how, has, has, has encouraged them to make a decision in the past and they're going to judge you as a salesperson or as a business owner based on their previous experiences. And even though they're judging you based on their previous experiences, some which will be positive, but in the large majority in my research, they are not positive. They are negative emotions and negative feelings around the buying process or the sales process or the sales experience or the buying experience. They will refer you emotionally, psychologically from memory to that person, to that experience, to that time. Therefore, they're going to judge you based on that. They're going to judge you unfairly based on that. So how do we separate ourselves? How do we become different as salespeople? How do we become different as business owners? Because as business owners, we are marketeers, we are salespeople, we are mini accountants, we are everything because we have to be until we can afford to bring other people in to be able to do that with us. We need to be 1% different. I challenge you to look at your industry and look at what other people are doing Look at everything that you like about it and the bits that you don't like about it. Think about the customer journey. Write out and map out the customer journey from the start, from the initial first point of contact, from website, social media, whatever it might be, and then think about the actions that you take, the steps that you would take with building a relationship with that individual. So overlay the customer journey from first point of contact through to when they buy, through to then they continue to buy with you in long-term relationship for the next 5, 10, 15, 20 years. Then overlay your customer process in terms of what do you need to do and what should you do as extra to really build that relationship for the longer term. So customer journey, then almost your sales process. And then ask yourself, how, how would you want to be treated? How would you want to be treated? See, defining this stuff and mastering your sales 
isn't really difficult. It's just the fear that stops us. But when you bring in the human element and you really look at it from that point of view of how would I want to be treated? Is this a fair thing to do? Is this ethical? Would I want to be on the receiving end of this experience? See, there are very few products and services that are new. So we're not having to create the market anymore in so many areas because the market already exists. Take mobile phones, for example. No one has to convince anyone that they need a mobile phone. What I have to do in my telecoms company is provide a better service to look after you better with your telecoms than other people do, to understand the full spectrum of your communication needs, to be able to support you from mobile landlines to fixed Wi-Fi systems to lease lines, whatever it might be, the entire comm spectrum, boip the lot. That's what I need to understand with you. But also I need to understand, you know, what are you doing with your business in the next two years to five years? Because a lot of these contracts you sign into with providers, they're two years minimum business contracts, some of them five years. So are you taking on a contract with 50 handsets that actually you're thinking about making redundancies because of current times, but you renew your contract now for 50 handsets and you're going to add to 20 people, you're still paying for those other 30 handsets. So I'm interested in what you're going to be doing with your business going forward, not what you've been spending in your business in the past. That's old news. I want to help you buy better for the future. So I want to help you make future-proof decisions as best as possible. And no, it's not an exact science, and we're still going to make mistakes, but we continue to learn from those mistakes. So my role as a professional salesperson, and I believe your role as a professional salesperson, as a professional business owner, self-employed, sole trader, whatever you want to call yourself, whatever your identity is, you need to be enthusiastic about all the aspects of business, and that includes sales and marketing. So as a professional salesperson, I want you to get real with the process of helping human beings buy better. And even if that means you have to walk away from a sale because it's not right for you and it's not right for them. And the sooner you get this, the sooner you clarify who your kind of customers are and what you do do and what you don't do, the simpler and more systemized and more steady your business grows because you understand it better yourself. Therefore, you can explain it better to other people. And when you explain it better to other people and you question them and you support them in their decision-making process because you challenge their decision-making process, you challenge their thinking and acting because you are different from your marketplace. You are different from their decisions in the past. You are different from those buying cycles that they're used to. When you do that, you stand out for the right reasons. And even if that customer doesn't buy, because I've had this firsthand many, many times, even if that, that customer doesn't buy from you at that point, you have the chance of them coming back. But also they refer because the experience was an enjoyable one. The experience was built on a relationship, not a sale. And that sticks. They remember that. And they will refer people to you because they believe the process that you took them through was thorough, was ethical, was honorable. But only if you behave in that way. So... Stop convincing people. Start exploring with them why they want what they want. Start exploring with them what they need it for, what they can do it for. Why is it important and why now? You know, And figure out how much on average it costs them and share that with them right up front and ask them the question, listen, you could do this yourself. So if it's going to cost you £1,500 to do it with me, why would you even consider doing that? Yeah, bold questions like that that stop them in their tracks because no one's actually asking them those kind of questions. They're just trying to vomit and smoke and mirrors and magic up a sale. Don't be that person. Be the wizard. I'm off to have a brilliant day of coaching. I'm off to teach people sales and business. And I love what I do with a passion. I get up every day on purpose, every single day on purpose, doing what I love. And when you do that, money comes as a byproduct, but it's not your main focus. And when you change that belief in yourself, I also see a level of freedom that many of you are struggling to reach. Please don't let these token things become the paralysis of your business. Money is an energy and money is needed, but it's not the be all and end all. I promise you that. Being able to sleep at night because you've helped people make the right decisions. 
And it's don't underestimate the power of those little voices when they start interrupting you when your hip, hip uh, head hits the pillow late at night and you know you've made a bad decision that day or you know that you've done something that you really shouldn't have done. Those little demon voices will come and they will hit you hard and they won't shut up because deep down you know <laughs> it was the wrong thing to do. So you want peace of mind? Start being better and encourage other people to be better and make better decisions and be part of that enjoyable process that makes you smile from the inside when you go to bed at night and you go, do you know what? I'm on purpose. And then you're on purpose and get paid for it. Win-win. So thanks for listening, Sales Academy Crowd. Share it, like it, comment. Get in touch. Let me know what you want to talk about. Let me know what, some, what subjects you'd like to hear about because I've got years of experience in business in a wide range of sectors, private, public, and others, so, and the third sector. So I'm more than happy to share experiences with you. You know, There's, there's always a need to be enthusiastic about all aspects of business, finance, marketing, sales, systems, people, the works. It's up to you. It's your remit as a business owner to continue to develop and grow. You know, if you're like a tree, if you're not growing, you're dying. Have a brilliant week. Stay awesome. Love you. Get in contact. Catch you soon.